Luke 22, 31 through 34. Will you have it? Please say amen. 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 The Word of God says like this for his honor and for his glory. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day. Before that, thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I take my thought from this phrase. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Jesus saw Peter's failure, but he said, when you get back up, strengthen your brethren. I want to preach for a few more moments over the topic, failure is not final. Let's lay our Bibles down and close our eyes and God have his will tonight. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you one more time. Thanking you for all that you've done these past two services, God. God, but I believe, God, that you will exceed tonight, God. And I thank you, God, for what we felt, for the unity, for the hunger, for the response to your word. God, get me out of the way and have your will tonight. Speak what you want to speak. Do what only you can do, God. I pray, put the devil in his place and let your name be glorified in this hour, Lord. God, I pray that you would reach God to the innermost part of everyone's heart, God. Do spiritual heart surgery tonight. Speak to us. Confirm the word with signs following. In Jesus' name, we pray. You may be seated saying glory to God. Amen. And once more, turn to your neighbor and say, God's going to speak to you. God is going to speak to you. Amen. Failure is not final. Who am I? When I was seven years old, my family was forced out of their home on a legal technicality. And I had to work to help support them. At age nine, my mother died. At 22, I lost my job as a store clerk. I wanted to go to law school, but my education wasn't good enough. At 23, I went into debt to become a partner in a small store. At 26, my business partner died, leaving me a huge debt that took years to repay. At 28, after quoting a girl for four years, I asked her to marry me. She said no. At 37, on my third try, I was elected, elected to the U.S. Congress, but two years later, I failed to be reelected. At 41, my four-year-old son died. At 45, I ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, I failed as a vice presidential candidate. At 51, I was elected president of the United States. Who am I? My name is Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was no stranger to failures, but history records that he failed forward. He was determined to succeed regardless of the mishaps of life and the obstacles that he faced. He knew the bitter taste of disappointment and failure, but history tells us that he became a president that was, did a lot of change for this country. He did not let his failures define him. His failure was not final. He knew what it was to be persistent regardless the, criti the, the, the critiques of those around him. The, 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 the feeling of rejection, but he kept going forward. Failure. We have all tasted this one time or another in our life. It's defined as omission of occurrence or performance falling short we've all had failures in our lives if you try something new in life chances are you have failed romans 3 23 says for all have sinned 
and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. In fact, a lot of people we read about in the Bible messed up. Abraham, the father of faith and of the Jewish people, lied about his wife twice. His son Isaac did the same thing. Sarah, Abraham's wife, laughed at the promise of God, then denied that she laughed. Jacob lied and connived. Noah got drunk. Samson was immoral. Gideon was fearful. Rahab was a prostitute. David had an affair and then had someone murdered to cover it up. Elijah was deeply depressed and did not want to live. And Jonah ran from God. The disciples fell asleep when they should have been praying. Hebrews 11, known as the Hall of Faith, remembers these individuals as men and women of faith. We see their, tr we, we see their victories. But they also had failures. But regardless of their failures, the Lord saw the victories. Regardless of their mishaps, they reached their destiny. There was Moses who murdered somebody and ran from his calling. For years. The Apostle Paul, as we have read in the scripture, was no exception. The Apostle Peter may have been the most outspoken of the 12 apostles in Jesus' ministry on earth. He certainly became one of the boldest witnesses for the faith. His beginnings were certainly humble in origin. He was born in about 1 BC and died sometime around AD 67. Peter, originally named Simon. Jesus was one, the one who changed Peter's name. Peter means rock or literally Petra. He was a Galilean fisherman and was a brother of Andrew. The brothers came from the village of Bethesda. Peter was a married man, a follower of John the Baptist. Peter, like all humans before their calling, was a sinful man. In fact, he was ashamed of his sinfulness in the presence of Jesus Christ, as Luke 5 records. Peter was perhaps the very first disciple that Jesus called along with his brother Andrew. Fishermen at that time were gruff, vile, and shabbily dressed and often used vulgar language. The fishermen of the first century were a man's man. They were full of vigor and had a boisterous temper. This is perhaps why James and his brother John were called the sons of thunder. Theirs was a rough life since fishing was a very physical, demanding job. They must have been somewhat fearless too because of some of the storms that came quickly upon the Sea of Galilee. They often caught the fishermen by surprise. They could easily capsize the 20 to 30 foot boats they used. Peter was a tough man. He was caught all, oftentimes putting his foot in his mouth. But one thing that you could say about Peter was that when Jesus told them, follow me, they simply walked away and left everything they had without a second thought. He left everything, his fishing boat, his fishing nets, and all the accessories that came with the trade. How many today would be willing to leave their life and follow Jesus? Peter was a man like you and I. Peter had flaws. Peter had flaws and Jesus knew he had flaws. But besides all this, the Lord saw further, more than Peter could see. And the Bible records in Luke 22, 54 through 56 that Peter denied Christ and was not able to live up to his promise to Christ. It says, they took they him and led him and brought him to the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him, and he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, 
thou art also of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And about the space of one hour after another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow also was with him. For he is a Galilean. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crew, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. We have all tasted failure. Peter promised God, I'll go with you to the ends of the earth and to prison and death. But in the midst when he was confronted with persecution, confronted with his life being on the line in association with Jesus, he was tempted to deny Christ and he denied Christ. He failed according to himself and the Bible says he went out and wept bitterly. This man that was a, a man that had been with Jesus, had followed Jesus, the greatly beloved Peter that Jesus so loved, failed Jesus. But Jesus saw this. Jesus saw in Peter's humanity, Peter, I love you. I have a destiny for you, and I know your flesh will get the best of you in the future. But I prayed for you that your faith fail ye not. Your faith fail ye not. That once you get back up and you're converted once back to following me, strengthen your brethren with your testimony. Mark 16, 1 through 7 tells of when the when Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James went to the tomb and they bought sweet spices to go and anoint the body of Jesus. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. They said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. Jesus specifically ordained these words to be said out of the angel's mouth. Go tell his disciples, and Peter. Peter being in a point of anguish, a point of regret, Jesus still had a calling for his life. His plan was still going to be fulfilled even though Satan had gotten in the mix. What the enemy has tried to do in your life and tried to mess with your family, mess with your life and cause you to fail. But God is saying there is grace and mercy that's new every day. You might have fallen, but it's time to get up. You might have messed up, but it's not over. There is hope in Jesus. There is hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. I failed many of times, but it's the Holy Ghost that has raised me back up to face the regret and the guilt and the shame. And I, I wonder at times, like that song says, I wonder why Jesus loves me. Why does he care so much about me? Even though I've been unfaithful, he has been and continued to be faithful. Even though at times I feel 
feel like I'm not deserving most of the time, all the time, but God is good and good all the time. The Lord is saying to the church today, it's time to get back up. The mental battle can be debilitating, can be tiring and intimidating, but God is saying, if you keep your mind stayed on me, I will keep you in perfect peace. See, God gives the people of God the ability to see life when others see death, to see beauty when others see ashes, to see joy when others see weeping. The Bible tells me in Acts chapter 20 verse 9, as Paul was preaching, there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep and as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead and Paul went down and fell on him and embracing him said trouble not yourselves for his life is yet in him. When everybody else saw death, Paul saw life. When everybody else saw a failure, Paul said, there's life, there's hope, and there's a future in this young man. And God sent me to tell you, you might see death in your situation, but here I see life. You might feel like things have died in your life, but Jesus came to resurrect what... What the devil thought was over. See, when the devil got his demons in hell and they got some uh, forks and, and knives ready to eat you for steak dinner, we got him now. We made him fall this time. He's not getting back up. I've messed with his marriage so much, he can't minister anymore. I've beaten his kids up so much, I've gotten them. When hell sat back and thought, I got him. When Jesus died, hell thought, we won. But Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. Some things that seem dead, when the Holy Ghost touches them, they will arise. See, the devil thought that he had you. He thought that he made you fall for the last time. But when the Holy Ghost, when the Holy Ghost intervenes into your life, there's something that rises up in you. Get up, weary soldier. Get up, soldier. There's hope and there's faith. There's hope for you and your family. Isaiah 61 3 says to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes the oil of joy for mourning the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness that they might be called trees of righteousness the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified Jesus told the disciples before he left to heaven unless a grain of of, of, of a, 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 a grain of wheat fall into the ground it can, and die, it cannot produce fruit. Where I am, you shall be also. You want revival? We're going to have to die. We're going to have to die to this flesh. We're going to have to go through the sifting the process of time. To everything there's a time and a season. A time to mourn and a time to laugh. And the morning is inevitable. Winter comes no matter if we don't like it. The night comes. But it won't last very long. When's the last time? You've taught a Bible study. When's the last time you got drunk in the Holy Ghost? When's the last time that you truly felt the joy and peace of God? 
When's the last time you had a Bible study at home with your family? A prayer meeting. God is calling you to rebuild altars. The enemy has come against you like a flood. But he that has built his house on the rock will withstand the test of time. Offenses will come, says the Bible. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But I will help you overcome them all, the Bible says says, for it is necessary to suffer much affliction to enter the kingdom of God. But as I have overcome the world, ye shall also overcome. In living for God, we joined a battleship, not a cruise ship. Peter's strength could not help him in this time. Peter's talent could not help him. Peter's ability could not help him. The Bible record, uh, history records he was probably 5'7", five, 5'8", five, but a stocky man. And even though he was physically able, he could not get himself to come back. But Jesus loved him so much. He went looking for Peter. Just how many of us are here because he came looking for us. We didn't look for him. He came looking for me. And Peter wept bitterly. Psalms 35 says, For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life, and weeping may endure for a night. But joy cometh in the morning. See, it's that joy that will keep you when there's storms on the outside. You have peace on the inside. This world might have peace on the outside, but they have storms on the inside. See, what you have, uh, Bill Gates does not have. What you have, all these men that have money don't have. They go to bed depressed. They go to bed empty. We might not be rich in money, but we're rich in faith. We are rich in faith. When I was preaching in Honduras, I told him, look, with all respect, many of you come to the U.S. looking for a better life, and that's respectable. But true joy is in God. Don't wait till you're in the U.S. and have material blessings to feel satisfied. True joy is in God. True peace is in the Lord. True joy. You have to work to keep it. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. As I was praying, I felt a messenger of Satan come and try to intimidate. Because the Lord knows, the Lord has plans for this church. And the enemy does not know those plans, but he can see, he, can, he reacts to what God is doing. There's a reason why there has been discouragement in some individuals. There has been fear attacking you. Thoughts you can't understand that make no sense. Thoughts of suicide. Thoughts of depression. Thoughts of anxiety. And it makes no sense. You don't understand what's going on. In your mind. But God is wanting to remind you. I've given you victory. I promised you victory. If the enemy can convince you. That those thoughts are going to happen. 
you give them power in your mind. The enemy needs legal right to mess with you. When you, give, when you begin to speak those thoughts into existence, you allow them to come into your life and mess with you. Perhaps you might find yourself in a cave of regret. You might be beating yourself up, why did I do that? Or why can't I be better? John 21, 15 says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. For the third time, and Simon, son of Jonas, lovest me. Peter grieved because he had said unto him third time, Lovest thou me? By asking Peter, Do you love me three times? Jesus was emphasizing the importance of Peter's life. Love and unswerving obedience to his Lord as necessary for his future ministry. It's interesting that he denied Christ three times. And Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? Do you love me? It's Peter that was a spokesperson on the day of Pentecost. It's Peter that he gave the keys to the kingdom. Peter, the one who denied Christ, who cut the ear of the Roman soldier, who had a, a, a foul mouth, but Peter, God, Jesus came and gave him love and said, I believe in you, Peter. I believe in you and your ministry is still Alive and well. Tonight, God's going to resurrect some things in your life. He's going to do a great work tonight. If you've not had peace in a long time, if you've not experienced joy in a long time, tonight is your night. If you've come tired of the failures of life and feeling guilty and ashamed of sin and you have never tasted the Holy Ghost, God can fill you tonight. If you've come and you feel like you have no hope, God can give you hope tonight. Even though we're weary in body, God is going to move tonight and you will leave change. You will leave better and you will leave with more faith than you came in today. I don't come preaching about just any God. I preach the one God. I preach the powerful Jesus. I preach the one who is the same every day and will ne his word will never perish. His word is still true. There's a poem that I would look at and read in the toughest times of my life. And it says like this, when things go wrong as they sometimes will, when the road you're trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high, and you want to smile, but you have to sigh. When care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you quit. Life is strange with its twists and turns, as every one of us sometimes learns. And failure comes about when you might have won had you stuck it out. Don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out. The silver tint of the clouds of doubt. You never can tell just how close you are. 
it may be near when it seems so far. So stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. There's times you come to church and you drag yourself to church. You pull your family that at times seems like it's going through the storm of the greatest storm of life. But if we just keep on going, if we just keep on going, victory is so close. The promise is so close to being fulfilled. God wants East Gate to know you are so close. I know it gets weary. I know you're tired. I know life gets tough, but keep on keeping on. Keep on going. My mercy is rich. Where sin abounds, grace doth more abound. Where it seems like it's hopeless, I will intervene and show you my glory. I'll intervene and show you my glory. For Moses to see the glory of God, he had to do things that made no sense. For Jacob to see and see the glory of God, he had to do things that made no sense. Abraham, all these men, even though they had failures, they had faith enough to get back up and say, God, you've called me. God, I believe in the calling on my life and I will keep on preaching. I will be instant in season and out of season. I will keep releasing faith at my job, releasing faith to my family, releasing promises to those around me that you have given to me. Your failure is not final. I wrestled with what I would speak tonight. But your failure is what keeps you in your seat from moving forward. You come to church and you're paralyzed by your failure. The harder I try, the harder I get hit. Why try? The more I pray, the more my family gets hit. The more I fast, the more marriage problems I have. The more I try, the harder it seems. But God promised you the victory. God promised you that you will overcome. I wonder if we could stand. I feel conviction in the house. Before you can go forward as a church, there's some things God has to deal with. The weariness of a mental battle is getting to you. We've had awesome services, but when you go home, that lying spirit whispers in your ear. You'll never change. You'll never overcome. But God wants us to deal with some things in this altar. I've forgiven you. Now forgive yourself. Stop beating yourself up. I've called you. And I'm going to use you greatly. I was the most rebellious young person in my youth group growing up. I would say, God, you can never use me. I failed too many times. I wouldn't move in services. But until I forgave myself and realized God didn't call me to be perfect.
He called me to try. He called me to try. I'm going to do something different tonight. I know we're tired. I'm going to ask for the Godfrey and your, and your wife, if you could please come forward. Brother Brad, you can come forward, please. The Lord is going to give rest, strength tonight. All of us, please come forward as well. the goosebumps fade and the height of the service goes away what will keep you is are you persuaded do you truly believe what God has said without a shadow of a doubt do you trust God because when you're not in church and when you're by yourself being persuaded in God is what will keep you to resist temptation Believing his word and staying true. The Godfrey, you're a dear friend. And I know that life gets weary. God honors the sacrifice of his young couple. Many times we see people in our church and we don't really appreciate what we have in our leadership because we get so used to it. But God's given you awesome leaders in this church that love God and love prayer. And I wonder if we can pray for the leadership. I'm going to ask, sister, if you can come forward as well with your daughter. I want us to raise our hands. And I'm going to ask the church if you can come behind these two couples. Lay your hands on the couples. Let's pray strength over these families. That's it. Begin to pray. Begin to lift your voice. The Lord is reminding you, I've made you the head and not the tail. I promise to keep you. I promise to be there in the tough times. I promise to keep you and help you. Part of the word restoration is rest. God wants to give you rest and restore strength. Lord, I pray strengthen my brethren. Help them, Jesus. Now the burden gets heavy at times but you have promised not to give us more than what we can bear I thank you God for this couple that loves you this couple Lord that's been called for a purpose God and I believe that you'll use them greatly that you'll use them greatly God to impact our generation 
in the name of Jesus Christ. That's in the name of Jesus. I pray for strength. I pray for strength, God, in their lives. Lord, I thank you for the favor and the grace in their lives, Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's it, church. Continue praying. Continue praying. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Lift your voice tonight. Lift your voice tonight. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I see fresh oil. I see fresh oil. Lord, I pray, God. I pray, God. For all the souls that will be impacted by this vessel. God, you see his heart, God. You see his willing heart, Jesus. I thank you, God, for this family. The, God, the repeller in this church. The repeller in this church, God. And I thank you. Protect their going in and their going out, Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. That's it, that's it. I feel a loosening in the Holy Ghost. I feel a loosening in the Holy Ghost.